first off, oh boy, we're going to have such a good time. I can't wait to talk about this movie with you. But I want to assure you that there are no spoilers in this non-spoiler review. But Grace, why is it so damn long then? Well, that's because we have so much to discuss, even without spoilers. My, I, have, I have five columns of notes here. That's usually just for spoiler reviews. But... I'm reviewing a four-hour movie here. I've never reviewed a four-hour movie before. I guess with streaming shows, I kind of have. You know, and Netflix drops a whole season at once. Uh, but this is certainly interesting. This is an experience. It was an experience watching it, and it's a, it's an experience. It's been an experience covering it. Uh, but this is not only four hours, but it's a redux of a movie that already came out, which means there is so much to be addressed. Now, like many of you, I was real nervous about the Snyder Cut. I mean, the hype levels are incredibly high. I think it might be the most hyped up movie of all time. But the hype has been building since 2017. And I even said in my reviews then that it would haunt the film, uh, what could have been. Uh, that, and you know, and of course everyone always imagines it's going to be better, but you worry, will it? And then also so much footage was used in Joss Whedon's version. It's been making everyone nervous as the haters say, so therefore could it really be that different? And then also there's the length. Can a casual viewer sit down and watch a four hour movie? I'm a committed viewer. I'm hardcore. And I was nervous about it. it you know, I, I wanted to start it earlier in the evening than I did. I'll talk about my viewing experience. But I, st I wanted to start it at 6. But, you know, best laid plans and all that. I ended up starting it at 8, and I finished it at, at midnight. So, you know, set an earlier time for yourself so if you don't hit it, you still can end at a pretty good time. Uh, luckily, it comes out on a Thursday. And I know many of you have taken the day off for it. Uh, so anyway... I was thrilled, and you can imagine how thrilled I was, that it became apparent right away watching the movie that we have finally gotten the Justice League film, that amazing Alex Ross-inspired poster promised us all those years ago. This poster accurately represents the Snyder Cut, whereas um, I like it in color, to be honest with you. I know the black and white is very special to Zack Snyder because that's the way he watched the film for so long because he only had the black and white print to work with uh, after he left the film. But I, I like the color version very much so. And then this other poster that came out is very indicative of what Joss Whedon delivered. So anyway, it is wildly different from Justice League. And I think the best, simplest comparison is the Wonder Woman hostage sequence. I watched them back to back for comparison. And the difference is night and day. For instance, the Snyder version is about double the length of that, uh, of that sequence. Watching the Snyder Cut is actually a master class, especially if you're interested in filmmaking at all. Either as just uh, a fan or it, it, actually in the, in the process, maybe because you want to do it yourself someday. It's to, to see how uh, letting scenes breathe, i.e. making them longer, editing, color correction, music choice, and making the extra effort with additional VFX, how that's totally transformative. Like, it's, I think many people will watch some of these sequences back to back just to see like how mind-blowing the difference is between them, even though Joss Whedon is using some of the same footage. I mean, from a filmmaking perspective, it's fascinating and shocking to see how Whedon changed the film so dramatically with cuts, sloppy inserts, uh, an ADR replacement when you can't see an actor's mouth. I mean, that it, it's just incredible. Uh, and to see how Joss Whedon hacked up Zack Snyder's original film. You know, when uh, when they were first talking about the, some of the, the, they revealed some of the behind the scenes stuff recently, not all of it, but they've revealed some of it. And they said that Deborah Snyder and Christopher Nolan said that Zack shouldn't see this movie because it would be too heartbreaking. And you hear that and you're like, come on, he can take it. I have to say, seeing this film now, what, what Zack Snyder originally intended, and how, what, what, and again, I think hacked up is the right way to describe what Joss Whedon did to it. It would be too heartbreaking and horrible. I don't think he should ever see what Joss Whedon did. I mean, but for us, because we don't have any skin in the game, I mean, we do as fans, but I mean, we can take a more you know, we're, 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 we have some distance from it, and it's really an incredible case study. This should be used in film school. That's how amazing it is, the difference. And it is shocking and frustrating and upsetting and unbelievably stupid that anyone would think to do that to what Zack Snyder did and that someone else would allow them to. Is the Snyder Cut a big swing? It sure is. I can see why some executives might have been a little nervous, but I mean, 
I think they should have gone with it. I mean, yeah, it's dark, it's intellectual, and it's operatic, which I think is the scariest thing about it maybe to a suit. I mean, Zack Snyder views these heroes as modern day Olympians, which is a totally valid take, which I think Zack Snyder makes work. Uh, but like Batman says in this movie, sometimes you just have to have faith and to stand by the conviction of a bold artistic swing. They were, you know, the Warner Brothers suits were nervous about Joker too, because that was such a bold artistic swing. And look how that turned out. And I think this will have similar uh, positive repercussions. I, I think we all like bold dramatic swings. They're fantastic. Because to me and many others, what makes the DCEU the strongest is that it's not like Marvel. I mean, that's always been the case with the comics, that they exist in two very distinct different spaces. Uh, and you can be fans of both, but who wants more of the same? I think it's great to have different flavors out there with superhero movies. Uh, and that's what you have here, a very different flavor. I'm also happy to report that I don't believe that there are any elements here like the Martha interaction. Although I still liked that. I could see why people didn't like it, but I, I've been reading comics. You know, I've been a fan like, my, like most of my life of DC Comics. And until that scene, it never occurred to me that their mothers had the same name. I was like, oh my God, how did I miss that? So I liked that scene, but I can see why some people did not. And also the changes to Doomsday's origin were frustrating. Some of the stuff with Superman here might frustrate some people, but I think for the most part, I don't think haters will find anything that they can ridicule like they did with Batman v Superman. I mean, some haters will find a way because that's what haters do. But I think that this film really is, I, it's a shame that it has to play defense, but I think it plays defense very well. I'd say this is Zack Snyder's best movie that he's ever made. Uh, isn't that great considering how much is riding on this? And he really stepped up to the plate and I think hit a home run. This is his best film to date and I think Watchmen is right behind it. And the two films actually have a very similar vibe, which makes sense because it's the same filmmaker. So how did I watch the film? I did it in one sitting. I was nervous that I, I mean, I knew I had to, but I was nervous it might be difficult. It was not. Um, the chapter times give the film very strong pacing. They end them so great. They, every single one of them ends on a great moment and they cut to black and you're like, oh, and then the new chapter comes up and you feel like you've unlocked a new level of storytelling. So that really, the chapter times are really extremely well utilized. Perhaps the best I've ever seen of chapters in a movie. Uh, and they add gravitas to the situation as well. Uh, and also sometimes the chapter time will show up in the, in the dialogue and you're like, oh, there it is. Uh, I took one quick break. I mean, it's four hours. You have to take a quick break. And I, th and I took it at the time that Zach said in our interview about how to, you know, the viewing guide interview that I posted uh, recently with him. Uh, and I took that break at what's supposed to be the theatrical intermission after chapter four. Now you could split this into two nights, but, and I was wondering, I was like, can I tell you, you can split this into two nights, but you know what? Good luck stopping after how they end chapter four. You're going to keep going. So let's talk characters. Oh boy, isn't this fun? It's so great. It's so positive. I'm so happy to be talking about DC in this context. I hope that there's no, I mean, I think the haters won't succeed. I think this is really solid. All right. So anyway, another huge change is Steppenwolf, which you already know, of course, but I actually came to really love this turtle dude. I mean, I didn't think he would resonate the way that he does. I wasn't even sold on his new look, by the way, until I've seen, until I saw the movie. At one point, he does take off his shell, as I joked in my trailer breakdown, but he's so convincingly rendered and we get to know the character so well that I actually was made uncomfortable. I was like, oh, Steppenwolf, put your shirt back on. <laughs> I mean, he actually has a character arc, he has motivation, he acts, his little features are adorable. It was incredible. Uh, and the apocalypse elements from the comics are introduced, introduced, they're introduced here, but they're introduced solidly, strongly, a very strong seed is planted quite well. And I really loved seeing the Justice League interact as a team. That was so cool. It was great. I've never really been a huge fan of Justice League comics, to be honest with you, but I did very much enjoy the Justice League animated series. It's a tough team to write. Um, they don't have their first outright team mission until the second half of the film where they break into Star Labs. But it's, it's, that's not a spoiler. You know that from the original jo uh, Justice League but it's worth the wait. All their interactions as characters are perfect, as well as what they bring to the table and surprising. I'm like, I never thought of using that character that way. Plus the first shot here of all five together is so cool. 
I actually laughed out loud when I saw it. Now, there are two other team shots in the film, which I think are supposed to be more grand. But what I liked about this first shot of them in Star Labs was that it was so understated that it seemed very real. It reminded me a little bit of like what Christopher Nolan brought to the table. And then he made Batman seem like he could be real. Here are the Justice League. I'm not going to give anything else away about the scene, but there are other elements that help sell this. We'll talk about it in the spoiler review, but it just really resonated with me. I loved it. Also, this is a very violent league. Some people might have a problem with that, but come on. All right, so anyway, they go for the head first time around throughout the film, again and again and again, as you'll see. But they live in a much more violent world, to be fair. It's a strong choice, but, <clears throat> and, I, and I know some people have issues with this stuff, but I'll be curious to see how people react to that element. As for the Justice League members individually, I'm going to list them in the order of my favorites and get ready to be shocked. All right, number one, Wonder Woman. That's not that shocking, but I can't tell you how great it was to see the 2017 version of the character back in action. I liked Patty Jenkins' experiment. I, as I said in my coverage, there were definite problems to it, but I enjoyed I enjoyed the homage to the, to the peaceful version of Wonder Woman. But I, as I said at the time, I do prefer the 2017 Warrior version. So to have her back, oh, it was just so great. I really loved it. And while she and the Amazons are sexier than Patty Jenkins' version of the characters, gone are the horrible and offensive butt shots, etc., from Whedon's version. Snyder is very respectful of these female warriors, but also focuses, to be fair, very much on that warrior aspect. This is very much high-gloss fashion magazine, which is powerful. Women love fashion magazines. There shouldn't be an issue with it at all, the way they're depicted here. It's basically... 300, but with all women instead of all men. And it's incredible. Wonder Woman's action sequences are the most fierce in the film. And she's depicted here as being almost as powerful as Superman, like very, very close to his level of power, which I loved. I'd also like to note that the Amazons versus Steppenwolf scene is one of my favorite sequences in the movie and is also vastly and dramatically different than Whedon's version of it. As I tweeted, I'm hearing that some suits would like Zack Snyder to maybe direct Wonder Woman 3. Patty Jenkins, you know, she really messed up on Wonder Woman. We'll talk about this more, especially if it happens. But I mean, this is just something that I heard some suits are like kicking around because she's not only did she really mess up with... Um, with Wonder Woman 1984, it was rejected by so many people, uh, but she's very busy. She's booked. She's got Cleopatra and Rogue Squadron that she has to do before she can even get to Wonder Woman 3. So I think that, you know, she could still be involved as a producer, but I would like to see her and Zack Snyder maybe switch, where she's the producer and he's the director. And, you know, I know that some of you might be like, I don't know about that, Grace, but watch the Snyder Cut. You will understand why after you've seen it. Uh, then second place... Flash, I know, I'm shocked too. He went from last to second. And while he still can't run to save his life, he's just a horrible runner. With the extra space that he's given in this movie, Ezra Miller actually knocks it out of the park. He's the comedic relief, but now his jokes are funny. Even some of the same jokes hit better here because again, they're given more room to breathe. And also the character has more nuance. He's just not a joke machine because he gets dramatic moments as well. Warner Brothers has, when you think about it, bound Miller over the last few years here in Fantastic Beasts. And I'm so happy to see that when he is let loose and given space to work, he's as talented and as charming as when we first fell in love with him. He's still got it. So that's really sucky for him. That that's He's kind of been like dragged through the mud the last few years. Also, his action sequences, when you don't see his legs, are a visual Beast. I mean, they're just so incredible. And the use of his powers is so clever throughout the film. I just love, I don't like the way he runs, but I love to watch him do it. It's amazing. I mean, I actually feel after watching this, the Snyder Cut that maybe he could star in the upcoming Flash movie and not totally torpedo it. I mean, it's really, really surprisingly good. Then third, Cyborg! I know! I never would have guessed these would have been my rankings. This just goes to show how much these characters were shortchanged in Justice League. It's so brilliantly simple to make Cyborg a Terminator with internet access, yet the Terminator franchise has never thought of it. Like Flash, Cyborg is used here in very interesting and unexpected ways. I loved him during the Star Labs thing. That was so great! 
We will talk about it in the spoiler review. And he is shown to be incredibly powerful. He really is a digital god. I mean, the Olympian parallels work the way Zack Snyder shows these characters. And his emotional storyline is also very, very effective. Joe Morton, you always know how to talk on the heartstrings. As for the other actors of color who'd been stripped from the original film quite suspiciously by uh, Whedon and Jeff Johns, Iris West only shows up here in that one scene, briefly. And Martian Manhunter also shows up uh, only sparingly. But Ryan Choi, working at Star Labs, is sprinkled throughout the film and played not just by an Asian actor, but a, but a Chinese actor, uh, Zheng Kai. And you can tell in his, with his accent that he is a, a Chinese native. And it makes a really big difference. I think China would have loved to see that character and to see that character progress, as would the rest of the world, because Zheng does a great job. All right, my next favorite Justice Leaguer is Bruce Wayne, not Batman. I still don't love this Batman suit. I mean, outside of the iconic warehouse fight scene. But it's, it's, this Batman has never been able to recapture that, unfortunately. Uh, also, Batman has always had a tough time in Justice League stories because he doesn't have any superpowers. It's always hard with him. But Ben Affleck's Bruce Wayne, I think Zack Snyder is right to put him front and center instead of Batman himself. Still by far and away the best live action Bruce Wayne we've ever had. He's fantastic. He's so cool. It's fascinating to watch him strategize and work behind the scenes. Also here, his I'm rich line really works because he is just so filthy rich. I mean, he uses his money in really, really, really effective ways. And it's fascinating, you know, by the end of the movie, uh, because, you know, they have that Lex Luthor end credit scene, it occurred to me that you have two insanely rich men, Wayne and Luthor, fighting over the world using their leadership and business skills and their, their fortunes, especially when you think of how real life, uh, you know, incredibly wealthy figures are affecting the real world today. And I just also cannot get enough of Ben Affleck's Bruce Wayne. He's, he, it, it's, he's so good at here. I just really loved him. And I liked his interaction with Alfred as well. Alfred's still really, really bitchy. <laughs> but he, it's great. It's great. There's love there. You can see the love. Uh, then Aquaman. Now, Aquaman is very low here. Nothing to do with the way he's depicted or, or Jason Momoa per se, but it's really a case of James Wan getting to, the, to define the character first and doing such a good job. And I think that if Zack Snyder were to take another crack at Aquaman today, he would use a lot of what Juan did in his movie. So that's really just why he's low down here. But still, Jason Momoa interacts very well with the rest of the league and has great moments. I really enjoyed him, but that's just the only reason he's down here. And then, yes, finally, Superman is in last place. I know, I know, but that's because, to get real with you, He's not really in the movie very much. I'm as surprised as you are. His shadow is, and he very much bookends the movie. But even when he's brought back to life, it takes a long time for him to join the action. And also, speaking of the black suit, it's just a costume change here. It's not, they don't use the reasoning that it's a Kryptonian healing suit. So the color change doesn't make a lot of sense. It just makes it seem like he's copying Batman's style. You're like, why are you both wearing so much black? It, you know, and everybody else in the team is very colorful. I think Batman should be the only member in all black. And I think that if they're not going to make it the Kryptonian healing suit, I think Superman should be in his traditional colors. But wow, what a movie. I urge everyone to watch it, not just because it's entertaining and it's great to finally see a really good Justice League movie and to see what a great team they are and how they're so different from Marvel, but also to see what a difference a filmmaker makes. You will never get as good an, a, a, a chance to see how important that is and how something could be, how the same footage, well, there's much more of it here, but how some of the same footage can be so dramatically altered. It's, it's, it's incredible. All right, so that's my non-spoiler review of Zack Snyder's Justice League. More coverage coming when the movie hits HBO Max and other uh, services across the globe this Thursday. Share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now. 